Our next guest is the Senate representative from the 16th District, Senator Patricia Rucker. She joins us via telephone from the Capitol. Good morning, Senator Rucker. How are you today? Do we still have Patricia? No, I'm oh, still oh, there you Sorry, are. can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Oh, good. Good morning, all. Yeah, you didn't sound so good when you weren't talking, but once you started talking, <laughs> man, the improvement was like night and day. I forgot I put it on mute while I was waiting. Sorry. Oh, I, I think my show is best listened to on mute, by the way. And I've tried it several times in the studio accidentally. <laughs> and, and, and many agree with you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Therein lies the success of the idea. Uh, Senator Rucker is the chair of uh, 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 School Choice, by the way. And that's a, a newly formed committee uh, this year, if I'm correct, Patricia. Am, am I right that on that? Is, yes. All right, very good. You are also the sponsor of many bills. I want to get to some of those in just a few uh, minutes here. I want to ask you first and foremost, though, about the Senate tax bill, because we had a question in our comment section that uh, asked if we could inquire as to why the, th the three readings were waived when that was passed. So, you know, our version of the tax bill, you mean? Yes. The one that, okay, so technically we want to make... We had agreed as a caucus on what it is that we wanted to propose, and the idea was to get that proposal to the House of Delegates as soon as possible so that they could have time to look at what we had proposed and make changes and additions and then, you know, just keep the conversation going. Okay. And now, Bill just had a question in the last segment regarding the size of the tax cut. We were uh, just speaking in the previous segment to the speaker Pro Tem Paul Espinosa, who said their range in this tax cut could extend up to $900 million. Paul pointed out that Senator Tarr, the Senate Finance Chair, said $600 million or so is the top end that the Senate will go for. Any thoughts on if there's a building compromise uh, right now in the Senate for going a little higher than $600 million, Patricia? So I have not heard any updates um, from our leadership, so I can't speak as to whether they've made any kind of compromise agreement or, or raise the amount, but the last I heard is what you mentioned, $600 million is what we had to spend. Would you go higher to get a deal done, keeping it, say, under a billion, but uh, much much more above $600 million? My personal yeah, uh, like opinion, yes, but I'd like to point out always, I'm not on finance. I don't have access to all the numbers that the members of finance have, so, you know, easy for me to say yes let's go higher <laughs> do you have confidence that an agreement will be struck before the end of the session yes i do believe we will get an agreed up, um, upon tax relief for you know voters it really is a question of how fast and how much um not if why do you believe that because I think both bodies really, truly do want to get tax relief. It's not, you know, we're not doing any kind of political game here. We, we really do believe that that money belongs back to the taxpayers. And, um, you know, there's questions always whenever we've had discussions of tax relief, you know, how much can we afford? We don't want to risk. Um, too much, and then we have holes in our budget that require drastic cuts to services. We want to make sure we can still take care of the necessary um, business of the state. But having said that, I'm sure you know, Rob, um, having been around ever since I first ran for office, I will never, ever vote against reducing taxes. Um, I believe very strongly that the state of West Virginia does overtax its citizens, and I would love to see substantial tax relief now one more question on this because bill's chomping on the bit over there um <laughs> okay. one more question on this is 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 your belief that a bill will be struck based on hope and optimism or are you hearing some conversations uh that are indicating that uh, we're close so i have not heard an update like i said um ever since we sent the bill over to the house no one um you know is, is keeping me abreast of what's going on but I definitely believe we will find a compromise. It, when both sides want something, and it's just a question of how, I, I don't think, you know, the, the, we're not so far apart that it would fail. I really do believe we will find um, a way to get a pill through. 
Well, Senator, uh, I hope you do find a compromise. Uh, but when Senator Tarr was on the other day, he was very eloquent in spelling out uh, some of the pros and cons and the balance required. First, let's go back to the number used. He said that based upon long time, long-term projection, he was most comfortable around $600 million. He could go a little bit above $600 million, but he never even hinted at something close to a, a billion, such as $900 million. Uh, couple with that are some of the known or recognized expenditures the state's going to have to face. PEIA is one. The salaries of the correction workers and the teachers are others. And there's there's other things. Uh, uh, and uh, DHHR is going to require some additional monies as well. Uh, are you privy? Have you looked at a, a balance between all the needed expenditures and a pervert and a, a cap of some level and then what would be available for tax cuts have you done that i have not and this is where you know i'm a, I'm a, a disadvantage not being on finance so those are the I reckon, reports that I, that, uh, that was a mistake on my part. I recognize you are not on finance, so Senator, so I did not. I should not have said, oh, "Have you done that exercise?" That's that's finance. No. My apologies. No, 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 no worries. I I will tell you that they usually do um, come to the caucus, to the entire caucus, and give us the comparison and the you know the numbers exactly where they were the last time they came to us and talked to us about it was before we passed our Senate tax plan and our senate finance chair explained why how he came to 600 million and he did go through we expect the pay raises to pass we expect to do this pia bill we expect you know the dhhr um, reorganization bill and and he had a list of those priorities that we agreed uh, as a caucus for so he was taking into account all of those things um that was, of course, a couple of weeks ago. So now, you know, I don't know what has changed. If it's changed, I believe that the um, DHHR reorganization bill, we are going to be um, passing from the Senate. The House made a few tweaks, so we have to concur. But um, we're going to be passing that this week, and so will the pay raise. Um, so I, I just, again, I kind of have to just trust that they will come to us and give us those updates when they have them. And um, at the end of the day, I can assure my constituents, I do ask those questions. I will not vote for anything that doesn't make any sense, where the numbers do not meet. But I believe that, you know, we always have the intention of doing what is best for the taxpayers of West Virginia, being responsible with the funds that they entrust us with. But we really do want to return some of those surplus money to the taxpayers because they desperately need the help in these times of rising inflation, inflationary costs and um, assessments uh, of our home values and all those. There's a lot of things. I definitely want to provide that relief for them. Senator Rucker, this is John Gilstrap. Uh, let's talk a little bit about messaging. Uh, six weeks ago, more or less, the governor promised me $1.4 billion. And the next day, the House blessed the $1.4 billion. And now the the best that I'm hearing is somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 million. So suddenly my wallet feels $840 million lighter. How difficult is it going to be for you going to your constituents at, at the end of this? Let's, let's assume the best of all worlds. Everything passes and the $600 million you know, the, the package is, is done. Is, is it going to be an, a, an issue addressing your constituents and saying, well, yeah, we did that. We, we well, lost that money. Well, I, I will tell you that, um, again, so this is the legislative process. We, we have things that we start off saying, you know, we are planning on doing this. And then you actually get here and you realize that you are, you do have to make compromises or there, there's information you didn't take into account. Um, and, in terms of what the governor said, I, I have no control over what he says or what he promises, and he promises a lot of things. Um, I love the idea of being able to do, you know, the highest tax relief that we possibly could. I love the idea of personal income tax reduction, have always supported it, have always voted for it. But I also know that it is very difficult to pass tax relief and grow 
government. And there are some things that the governor does want to grow government. Um, there are things he would like to do that does mean um, baseline building of our budget. And that's difficult to do. Whether or not we have the funds for all of that, that is the you know, very important job that our finance chairs, both in the House and the Senate, have to, you know, weigh. And of course, every single bill that passes that has a fiscal implication changes the number. So, you know, my job is to let folks know, yes, this is what we passed. This is the amount of money that we had. And I supported the highest amount that we could get. And that is what I plan on doing. But anyone who, you know, um, is disappointed, I can only tell them that, you know, guys, this, the legislative process is exactly working the way it's supposed to. So the governor has ideas, the Senate has ideas, the House has ideas. We work together to try to get something through. Um, but it's not always going to look the same at the beginning of the session as what we actually end up passing at the end. And that happens with a lot of things, not just tax relief. From your point of view, what expendable is the wrong word, but I'll use it anyway. Of of the elements of the Senate plan, the marriage penalty reduction or elimination, the personal property tax, and the and where for you, where are the what elements of the Senate plan are you willing to surrender or say okay, we can do without in order to get a compromise with the with the House? Well, I, I'm not going to go through every single one of them with you, but I will tell you that I consider um, overall tax relief for all citizens to be the number one goal. Um, doing uh, things that benefit just one group is nice and, um, and sometimes very valid, but my overall priority is to give tax relief to all across the board. Senator Patricia Rucker is our guest here on the program. I want to talk about some of the bills you're sponsoring, Senator Rucker, and you can tell us uh, what kind of progress you're making on some of these. One of these has to do with SB 459, clarifying residency requirements for voter registration. What was the issue there? So um, <laughs> I've actually introduced that exact same bill pretty much every single year since I arrived to the uh, legislature. And when I ran for office and I was going door to door, you guys know I'm kind of famous for that. Mm -hmm. um, there were things that I learned as I went door to door that just shocked me. And one of those things was that our voter residency requirements are extremely lax and very vague. And therefore, um, it meant that folks who are here just uh, in the state visiting with no intention of residing and staying here technically could uh, register to vote. Um, and that bothered me. I thought that doesn't seem right. There should be a way of like ensuring that we only have folks who truly are West Virginia residents, pay taxes, plan to stay, you know, uh, for the foreseeable future when they register to vote, not those who are just here on a temporary basis. Um, and so really that was the purpose of the bill. When I first introduced the legislation in 2017, 2018, I, it was bipartisan and I had um, Senator Romano was a co-sponsor, um, which raised some eyebrows because he and I don't usually agree on a lot of things. But um, now, of course, he's gone. And I, I, since I've introduced it year after year and it's never run, I don't even bother trying to get co-sponsors anymore, but it is something I still think we need to fix. And I do bring it up um, specifically whenever we have any election integrity bills. It, other states, I've borrowed the language that other states have, um, and also from court cases where voters have been challenged as to whether they're residents and I've taken the language that the court has basically declared could be used for the Secretary of State to determine whether they truly were. So there was, there's nothing extraordinary about the bill. It's, it's just common sense. And until we put it into our code, we continue to have this very lax um, voter residency. I mean, I, it sounds like you're saying somebody visiting the state could actually register and vote? Yes. If you read the law... Um, the way it is now, you don't have to have uh, proof that you 
uh, plan to remain here or that you've been paying taxes here. All you have to do is show that, yes, you are living at this address as of this time, and you can register to vote. Don't you have to have a 60 days resident time? Yeah, there, there is a period of time. But like I said, that could be temporary. That could be you're here for some training. Um, that could mean that you have a home here and a home in another state, but you reside most of the time in the other state. Right now, there is literally nothing to preclude you from registering to vote and not being an actual resident and intending to stay in do, the state. Do you think we have a problem with that, or is that just a possibility? Well, that's the whole reason I introduced the legislation. It's because when I went door to door, I did uh, meet some, some some of these very nice folks who had no problem telling me that they pay no attention to the news. They don't read the papers. They are just here visiting, and uh, but yet they were on my list as registered voters, and that just bothered me. But if, if they've been here for a period of time, 60 days, I don't know what the residence time is, that's something more than just visiting in most cases. Well, I, I like I told you, I promise you that there are those folks who don't have any problem coming here, but they don't mainly reside here, and they're still registering to vote in the state of West Virginia. I did tell them when... I met them that, well, just realize you can only vote once. Um, you're not allowed to vote in your other state and this state. But still, like, once they're registered to vote here, you know, we have these voters that, um, you know, we, we let's just be honest. We don't always check on whether or not they're voting in our state or in other states. That's a job for the Secretary of State. And if it hadn't been for me going door to door, there would be really no one knowing that they were here on a temporary basis and had no plans on becoming West Virginia residents permanently. When they register to vote, do they also commit themselves to West Virginia taxes? No, they don't have to. Now, how are you not getting co-sponsors for this bill in a Republican-dominated Senate and House of Republican Party that in excruciating detail complains about election security around the entire country? I, like I said, I've kind of stopped. In previous years, I did get co-sponsors, and I did really, really work, but it's just been no interest whatsoever in taking up this legislation, and I kind of stopped, you know, um, working hard to get those co-sponsors. I, I, I've spoke about it with Senator Trump. It's in his committee. He understands what I'm trying to say. Um, I just, I guess, has never risen to the top of priorities. I'm baffled by that. Now, I'm just about out of time, so I want, to, uh, if you could, your priority of the bills that your lead sponsoring and some that you think might pass. Okay, well... <laughs> We have already passed a few, um, at least from the Senate side. Uh, I, I don't know about the House. But we passed um, creating charter school stimulus fund, which was something I really, really cared about. This was the second year I've introduced it. And it would help start up charter schools here in the state of West Virginia, like the Shepherd Aviation Academy that I know you guys remember mm -hmm. didn't make it off the ground. And they just, they just need some help and support um, because they're a brand new uh, startup. And I have a great bill that's passing today from our uh, Senate floor, glucagon for schools. The glucagon is a therapy for those who have diabetes and are going into diabetic shock that really, really helps their, you know, their health. And it's a safe product. And I wanted to make certain that our schools provided that because we do, unfortunately, have so many of our students that do have diabetes. Um, we have a bill that what came from Nate Harmon, uh, clarifying the terms and offense of human smuggling, and that um, is now in the House, and I think that's going to pass. My number one priority for this year was about dyslexia, and that didn't pass on its own, but the language got inserted into the Third Grade Reading Act which passed the Senate last week, and so I'm very happy about that. And on that, on that <laughs> note, Senator, I'm out of time. I want to thank you for oh, yours. Shoot. I, I, I'll, ha I'll have you back, and we'll get through some more soon, okay? That'll be wonderful, and hopefully I'll have more successes to tell you about. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, <laughs> Senator Rucker. Have a great day. Yeah. Senator Bye -bye. Patricia Rucker.